This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl, episode number what? 194? I can't believe it. Bonks. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's, How you it's, feeling today? Tough as nails, Timmy. <laughs> I feel fine. Um, but yeah, I, I feel fine. I, I overslept, which helped me feel fine. Yeah, well, we had a good time last night. Yes, we did. Great time. I was, uh, you know, releasing my comedy routine. Yes, it was uh, sharp as ever. And uh, also, you know, pretty insightful. It's all, all the above. is everything well, one would delightful. want. Yes, exactly. I, 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 did, I, I did like how uh, in the Q&A afterwards, as opposed to saying questions, you, you said answers. <laughs> any, gotta, answers? any answers? Any answers? I, I like well, that. Well, you know, and, and obviously that's enough to terrify me. And I'm surprised the whole room didn't flee at that point. But whatever. It was, a, it was a good time. We had a good time hanging out. Um, uh, it's been a month of madness. We've had a lot of fun, but the environment is suffering absolutely greatly as well as a lot of human beings uh there's okay. been 38 mass shootings this month alone come on now peeps in the united I states mean, that's <laughs> think yeah. about where else i <laughs> mean this is just i mean that's more than one a day and that's what we do around here well, that, we that's just, uh, we're okay with that i guess I, I guess as a nation it's uh there's a green light for that behavior because well i mean as nothing's someone, done about it yeah well as someone said guns don't kill people republicans do speaking <laughs> about republicans i'm just gonna call her lauren bobbitt from now on oh yeah that idiot who was on the house floor asking a oh, man right. If he had voted to decriminalize as if it should be a major crime, urination in Washington, D.C. And finally, one of huh? the women on the panel said, stop wasting our time talking about this. I'm like, for, well, of course, somebody that talks shit all the time is going to worry about other people pissing on the sidewalk. Well, uh, that's really stupid. And this is a great segue unless you have more to say about that. Uh, I do not. Michael Maris, 57, of Baton Rouge. Uh, he got arrested because he worked at the city water supply treatment <laughs> yeah. plant and he got caught on tape urinating in the city water, the, the water supply for the city. Of course, I don't think that that's going to be so diluted at that point, but still, you know, you don't want, you don't want your employees doing that. Um, I think, I think someone said, I think I saw Michael. It was Pitt. caught on camera. Well, someone went to the, someone, one of his coworkers went to the boss or, you know, if you will, and was like, I think Michael's like peeing in the water supply. Well, you know what? And so they, I they, can't they, say. They, well, he started going through the camera and, and, and sure yeah. enough. Yeah. Well, he, uh, there he was. He was kept on doing I, it. I can't say I'm a queen of golden showers, but urination in the water is not as bad as everything else that's been fucking happening well, in the water. Yeah, that's because true. this month alone, there have been so many environmental catastrophes that there's just too many to even keep up with at this point. I mean, it's just, you know, first we had the uh, East Palestine. Now we have something in Philadelphia. Then we have something in the Ohio River. We have like three something. more trains. A lot of things. Yeah, exactly. It's not stopping. I mean, this is just absolutely outrageous. I mean, since, you know, I mean, if you, if you follow, as I occasionally do, the Office of Response and Restoration, which is an environmental agency, which, which tells you, you know, where there are emergencies response is happening that i mean in january alone they responded to 14 new incidences in te 10 different states and 109 new incident reports and documents including i mean like it's just it's are, so these, are these numbers up i mean i think after east palestine everyone's kind of like looking for it all the time but i just wonder if this is just <laughs> same well, as this is kind january. of the usual i'm just talking about yeah, one yeah. month I'm yeah, i mean, I mean yeah month. so, so, so I that's mean, much worse than michael Maris's urine. I, I mean, well, the, actually, the boss, the boss did make a public statement. He, he said, I am extremely disappointed in Michael. <laughs> I find this conduct disgusting and unacceptable. I just want to know when the cops came and he was arrested, did they say, you're in trouble. I want. I, want, I, want, <laughs> Good one, Tim. I don't know. Good one. Well, I bet the people in Flint, Michigan, would have preferred drinking pee pee than drinking <laughs> water that catches on fire. There I you mean, go. you can just there take you a go. survey and tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. When when water catches on fire, you know you're in trouble. Jesus Christ. God. 
Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, then you got to really worry about setting your farts on fire. You won't even have to set them on fire. You'll just be blowing gas and on fire <laughs> out your own ass. Yeah, 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 that's a warning to all you who light your farts on fire. All right, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a warning. Alex, if you're listening out there. Oh, I'm yes. a bit silly today. But well, do you hear about this this new viral little prank on social media where they it's the bucket new, head? Yeah, the bucket thing where they yeah, they put <laughs> it on someone's head and they basically videotape while they laugh as, as a person kind of r- runs around like a decapitated chicken for a second. And well, there's one woman, uh, Lana Clay uh, Monaghan. Uh, she of Orange County. Someone did it outside of in the parking lot of a Target store. And then, well, it should happen to me that she's epileptic and has these like heart oh, issues. God. Next thing you know, she's being rushed to the ER. So, I mean, she's alive, though. I, I, I guess it's not so bad, but uh, I don't. You, people should well, think twice before, you know, doing that little prank on a rando. Uh, I don't know. Um, what, I, what do you got? What do you got? No, I got nothing. I mean, people are just stupid. They're cruel. And they're and they're so contaminated with toxic waste that's in everything we touch, breathe, sure. eat, and drink. No wonder they're all going Looney Tunes. Well, speaking of Looney Tunes, uh, well, they're not releasing the guy's name, but except for the victim, Paul Schmidt, thirty-seven of Vancouver, um, he was in a Starbucks with his fiance and his little toddler, who's about three or four, and some kind of guy was just like chain vaping. And, and which is not a technical, not allowed in the Starbucks. And he goes, do you mind like taking that outside? The guy didn't say anything, just turned around and stabbed him to death. Uh, yeah. And, and no one in Starbucks really did anything like, like this. Oh, so, like, oh, I bet they filmed it. <laughs> maybe. I mean, everyone's just like, oh, I want to stay out of this. But like this guy was dying and he and he died. And and, and basically the cops came and the guy who killed them didn't res- resist. He's like, OK, take me in. <laughs> I, I don't even know. I mean, they say smoking mind. kills, not vaping kills. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sure. I, well, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. Um, hmm. All right. Well, well, we have Greg Foreman coming up. Uh, well, he's a happy chap. He'll 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 cheer this podcast up. Uh, of course, he'll turn all frowns upside down. Uh, well, if he stands on his head, he'll turn his own upside down. Now we're talking. Um, I don't know. Do you want to do a outro slash intro into Greg, or should I dig up some more? stories no i no i don't want to dig anything up i'd like to say that in spite of this month of madness that's march we can only hope that at the beginning of april that would be april fool's day which uh, will have passed by the time this goes up or maybe it goes up on april fool's day april fool's day eve well we can only hope for a brighter tomorrow (laughs) oh oh, actually I, i i have a good point um so the real april fool's day it, it, it turns out it, it's not April 1st. It, and I think it's I think it's referenced in uh, the Canterbury Tales. One of these classic old um, books, um, English. Ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I think in like, I think Canterbury Tales was Middle English or Old English. I can't fucking remember. But um, April Fool's Day, it's supposed to be, it's like the 32nd day of April. That's why it's oh. like a fool, which doesn't exist. Which is of March or April? No, no, no. Of April, I forget what the translation. It's like thirty-two days after April first. I mean, there, there's like these new historians are like, no, it's actually been misinterpreted. It's 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 this kind of riddle puzzle fake day that doesn't exist, which is adds up technically to May second, which technically is my birthday. So I, well, I, I my my birthday is the real April Fool's Day. Turns <laughs> out, I don't know if that's a good well, thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, I think it's highly appropriate, Tim. Um, well, fair. I, you can fool not? a lot of the people a lot of the time, <laughs> oh, yes. but you can't fool oh. Timmy any other time. Well, the, I've had some epic stories this past week with things like that, but that's private info. Um, okay, anyhow, well, um, yes, you know, digress, I digress. My birthday's every day, so we'll just continue to celebrate. I'm going <clears> to <throat> celebrate. I'm going to continue celebrating my birthday now. In the most luxurious fashion of perhaps a little forensics, maybe mm. a spiked coffee, and uh, whatever else I can summon up. All sounds fun. It does I, sound like fun. I got some rehearsing this? today. Pardon me? I got some rehearsing to do soon. So. Well, that'll be fun. Anyway, so. this is and always was and shall forever remain the Lydian spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our special guest, Mr. Pharmacist Greg Foreman. 
This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and multi instrumentalist, master DJ, man about town, high fashion step and dresser, Greg Foreman. Hi, Greg. Hi, how are you? I'm so grateful to be here. So, well, yes, well, perfect. And, we... and Greg was uh, another character that was involved in uh, my takeover of Los Angeles with Tim Dahl and Joseph Keckler. On both shows that we did at the Zebulon with the Badass Babes of Burlesque and then playing and backing up Sylvia Black and I on both sitar and guitar. I know you miss us. We miss you, too. I do, indeed. You bring a, a, a certain sort of uh, controlled, chaotic light to this city that can be kind of sleepy. You know, I always say that L.A. is like... The same day every day, it's like being mugged by a rainbow, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's wow. nice. But you know what? I mean, when we were there, we were being mugged by the muggy rain. Right, right. Yeah. Half, half the days, but I wasn't crying about it. I had a great that. time. I, I, we had, I, a, I had a great, great time. time. Yeah. We had a great time. And, and, and Greg, you play a lot of instruments, and we're going to go back and start at the origins of the 12-year-old Greg Foreman. But really, yeah. I love that you play the sitar. And we've done a few shows a few different formats of shows together with you on the sitar. And I just think it's such a beautiful instrument. You play it. It's really beautiful what you do with it. And not an, I mean, are there many other sitar players out there? I mean, other than classic Indian? No, there's only really one other I know who plays with that band Black Angels occasionally. Um, he You're had, talking about in like rock music and stuff, because obviously yeah. there's, there's yeah. actually a lot. When did right. you pick up the sitar? Um, I was always interested in it, but I found one on Craigslist in, uh, it was like 2010 or 11. And I was like, I went and picked it up, you know, and it was, it was, it's like the Keith Richards of uh, sitars. It's always been missing a string, but I just, I'm like, I, this is good enough, you know. Was it hard to master? Well, I don't know that. I feel like if a classically trained Indian <laughs> master heard me, they'd be like, you you disrupt my culture, you know, but well, uh, it's it's beyond that. I mean, you have to be kind of to really do that. You have to be kind of born into the kind of family. And, and that's just a whole other pursuit. But why didn't you take what, what's the electric guitar sitar that they all use in the 60s? Why yeah. did you want the Why did you want the real deal as opposed to that? Well, because I, I you know, it's just like anybody like you, you know, you want to just learn from the real thing. You don't want to like. It wasn't about like the the actual like creating a sitar sound on guitar. It was like I want the actual instrument because it's got like a certain kind of soul to it. You know what I mean? And it really kind of when you're sitting there with it, it's like it's very sexy. It's just yeah. I mean, it's just like this. It got this historic thing. I mean, it just looks. Like this crazy. Uh, well, it's definitely a spectacle. I mean, did, did, did you ever take it on the road? Uh, no, no, yeah, that's, that's a little it difficult. Likes to stay a, at yeah, home and maybe well, dangerous. I mean, and it might get and also, you, you, uh, thank you to Sylvia Black. I mean, it's featured on our upcoming album, which will hopefully be out by the new in the new year. But mm -hmm. uh, it really adds a very special flavor to whatever whatever you play it on. So let's go back to the 12 year old Greg Foreman sure. and your first guitar. How did you even convince whoever, how did you get your first guitar and how, uh, how did you, how did you convince that you needed it? Well, you know, in, in my day, like uh, I was always inspired by whatever was on music in general. It just, it felt like a kind of instantaneous uh, ex form of expression that, unlike, you know, a piece of art you could go see or something you could read it, it could affect you and everyone around you in such a uh, instantaneous uh, moment, you know, rather than like... And physical so, way. Yeah. So I, I was, a, you know, there was music on the radio and, you know, this and that, but I, um, my stepdad, I got a stepdad at some point who was actually a pharmacist, where which is where I got my name, Mister Pharmacist. That um, and, and that and other things, no doubt. Now we're talking Philadelphia. Is that what we're talking about? Twelve years old in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. And I and and he got me a like a pawn shop, junk shop, sort of like Stratocaster looking thing. And uh, 
I was kind of like, at the time, I had met this lady um, who had an older sister who was into all great music, you know, like post-punky, you know, stuff like Magazine and Wire and all this stuff. So I was kind of like already out of the idea that I wanted to learn, like, you know, Smoke on the Water or whatever. <laughs> I wanted to, like, learn how to play, you know, stuff like Magazine and... uh all that kind of stuff. And, and, by, and, by, and by the way, I mean, Magazine and Wire, and I know you were just about to say Public Image, are three of my favorite bands of that period. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But what, what what about like Philadelphia Soul? I mean, did that have an influence on you? I mean, that this is, Philly has got, for black music in particular, is, is a major stamp in American culture. I mean, was this something that was just grabbing yeah. you? Well, yeah. Jokingly, I have my own genre called moth, which is one part mod, like 60s soul, and one part kind of, I would never say I was goth, but it's kind of the joke of the melding of the genres. But um, my parents were into what you're talking about. Like okay. all always in the house was Ike and Tina Turner, you know, like Stax Records. And Booker that's how your DJ, that's where your DJ, um, the beauty of your DJ sets comes in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so when I was a kid, the stuff that was played was soul, maybe some like 60s stuff like the Kinks and stuff like that. And then when I became a teen and I met this kid, I was telling you about this woman who was like my first girlfriend, her older sister turned turned me on to that whole other world. And it wasn't like today where we could just go online and like, oh, now I'm into everything. I've just downloaded the entire Internet. Um, it was like I'd go into the record store with a copy of uh, John Peel record. Right. And on the front were all the band names. And they were some of them were wild band names like cocktail twins or whatever and i'd get one band like say birthday party i'd be like hey what's the birthday party like and the guy in the shop would put on you know birthday party and i'd be like oh this is great and he'd be like if you like this check out x y and z cocktail twins check out the scientists or whoever you know and it was like so my education was that way um and films so we had a section at our video store called other and in other was like you know it's like a mainstream video store so other contained stuff like wim wenders wings of desire like jim jarmusch like down by law you know david lynch stuff some you know G godard kind of stuff so i would just go to other and just rent this stuff and it's there i saw wings of desire which like there's a scene which i'm i know you both are familiar with it, where there's a younger guitarist at the time called Roland Howard and there's crime of the city solution and, and Nick Cave and the bad seats. And they just, it was like this seeing these like beings that were sort of looked mythical. They looked like these mod gangsters with pointy boots and crow like spiky hair. And I was just like, wow. And the sound was sort of like, like what my parents would play like you know like bang bang by nancy sinatra or like lee hazelwood these kind of like western kind of like way out dark western themed things well, and, and, and by the way greg i want to say you did a fantastic job the few times we've played the roland s howard's still burning together and also what really impressed me one time when we were i think we were just hanging out you were djing at Bigfoot Lounge, and I just said, hey, not Bush City Limit, and you had the seven inch, and I'm like, all right, Greg Foreman, yeah. I got your number now. Yeah, I mean, that that's a, that's basically, to me, music. You told me this thing, so the funny thing is, Lydia and I met, I'd always, I'd known all these people for years around that world, like Jim Sclavunos, you know, uh, Kid Congo, you know, all these people uh, around and and Bob Bird, obviously, and then uh, from Knoxville Girls. And so years later, I started a podcast much like this, but I would uh, interview people that I found either kind of created something or inspired me. Some of them were friends, some of them weren't. And I really wanted Lydia on the show because, you know, she was there at a point in time that really inspired me, which was like the no wave sound, you know, uh, it was just kind of like right up my alley because it's like it's like punk people who decide like, well, maybe we'll learn how to play better. And we also um, like things like out sound, but soul like James Chance was covering James Brown. And it was just like so when 
when I interviewed Lydia. Is that when we met on Mr. Pharmacist, your podcast? And you said you you said there's a term and I have the book here, right here. It's by Lorca. It's called In Search of Duende. And you told me about Duende about, and Ray, basically you simplified it and you said it's the ability for any form of art to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It just stood up on the back of my neck from you saying that. Yes. And, 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 and no wave, yeah, no wave was not a sound. It was a, it's a philosophy basically. I mean, it's um, just like, if you, Thank get a, you, Tim. If, you get, if you get a PhD in composition that I was cause Dr. David or but button has one. That's a PhD in philosophy. That's what that's what that certificate says. So it's it's interesting how that that plays out. Um, so Greg, what was the name? Was there a go to record store that you that you relied on uh, in Philly? What was the name of it? If there was, was one called, or two, it was one. It was called Repo Records, and they they actually their first location was like underneath a train station, like. And it was like my mom would take me there. I was I didn't even drive yet. So she would drive me there. And these guys who were, you know, they, they had knowledge about like all this music. They were there and they would like, like basically tell me what records are really that are essential, you know, like suicide, television, whatever. And I would get these records, void or whatever. And then, you know, I um this record store still exists, but it moved. It's on South Street in Philly now, still called Repo Records, and the owner is still the same owner. And uh, I always give them a shout out whenever um, I'm talking about influences because that was the place I cut my teeth, so to speak. You know, so it's still in business. So I guess it really has a cultural impact in that city because record stores are not doing so well these days. Um, Hey, so, just a second, Tim. Can you hear me? Because I suddenly I, got jumped off of Zoom for some reason. I, I see, and, see and hear you. Perfectly. I can't see either of you or hear you, but I can hear you both. I can't see you. Okay, carry you on. Know, so, Greg, you know, my grandparents, my, my mother grew up in Philly, and my grandparents lived there, and I had some friends there, and definitely in high school, I'd do some late night, almost, I think, like, abandoned house, South Street parties. We might have crossed paths at one point. I don't know if you're... Hanging yeah. out at uh, you know, buying forties underage and going, <laughs> going yeah. into these like these houses, and those were fun parties if I remember correctly. I do okay, remember. so Greg, so Greg, you got yeah. your varied yeah. musical education from a variety of sources, and so did you start your first band uh in Philly? The Delta it was Delta seventy two, the first band you. No, believe it or not, I had a band and it was (laughs) so at the same time, this is not something that you particularly love, but like at the same time, stuff like Blade Runner, my dad had showed me Blade Runner and and, and the films of like John Carpenter were around. So the synthesizer was kind of like an instrument that was making its way into rock and roll. So people were like, oh, you got to have a synthesizer. And that led me to things like Kraftwerk, Silver Apple, Suicide. Um and so I wanted to learn how to play the synthesizer. So my first band technically was an all synth band called Synthetic Movement. It was like was it was it uh, was it new wavy? Was it new wavy? What what was it more experimental? What was it? No, it was not experimental. It was like it was like um, factory records kind of stuff. Like I just thought of a great name: Synthetic Lubricant. Could be the follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> Is, isn't lubricant usually synthetic? I mean, well, uh, well, I mean yeah, there is a natural. As as I'm concerned. One you buy in a store, I should say. <laughs> I, right. I wouldn't want to buy a lube that you buy from the store, but maybe, maybe I don't know. Yeah. Well, wait. You would you want to buy a natural lubricant? I can bottle some up for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yeah. So that oh was my, my first band, and we like played the talent show, and I'll never forget. You know, at this time, you got to remember. The way we look and what we're into, it was kind of a war. Like they were like the people that were there were like, I walked up the stairs first day of high school wearing a shirt that said alien sex fiend <laughs> and with this crazy spiky hair. Like I told you, came out of like a Wim Wenders movie. And the the guy at the top of the stairs was with a friend and he was like, what the fuck are you supposed to be? And I was like, oh, OK. And so. Because the 12th grade, like really huge metalheads, they were big guys. They also liked things like corrosion and conformity and uh, misfits and stuff like that. 
they were like, don't fuck with this guy. So it kind of kept me safe. Yeah. And then later, um, the, the, you know, the jocks girlfriends would had, would have taken like a, a semester in France and they'd come back and be like, Oh, you remind me of like a poet I met in France. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so like it, it kind of like backfired against them, you know, in a oh, way. Oh my! Well, I, as I, as I always say, like glam growing up in the glam period. I mean, the weirdos had the domination, not the norms, not the straight people. We were weird. Fuck you. We knew we were cooler than everybody else, and that was something the same as what you're saying. That just your weirdness. And even though they were jocks, they were still straddling this like really straight and bullshit thing, but also dipping their toes into the misfits. Hello, leave yeah. the weirdo alone. So the people, yeah, that, exactly. people, people that threatened you, what were they supposed to be and what were God, they into? Yeah. They were just like one of them uh, is like a family business. Is I won't mention the name because they don't need any uh, any, <laughs> any plug. Yeah, they um, except for except for in certain locations, right? <laughs> well, they're, they're, they like back Trump and all this kind of stuff, okay. and they were just like really rich kids, and I was just like oddball. Um, and it, yeah, also back then there were no there were no genres like you know now it's like oh I like goth or I only like minimal synth or I like it was like you were weird or you weren't, and the weird people hung out together, and they may like anything that's just left of center so at the time it was like the only thing that came around that kind of showed some of that in popular culture was mtv had a show called 120 minutes oh yeah i remember that thing where they would show like post-punk stuff and i was on it a few times look what it did for my career nothing well, 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 well especially the pre-grunge 120 minutes yeah. uh yeah it's a whole other vibe right yeah i had some spoken word clips on that which is hard to even believe today in this climate but that was what it was. Well, it was it was definitely the first time i saw another hugely influential band which was einster's Nine and neubauten and to me, like they were actually in one of the promo clips and it was just Blixa screaming. And I was just like, like, you just don't you're not prepared for that. And so I bought a record called Halster Luga, which is like a live-ish record. And years later, one of my bands opened for the fall in Neubauten. And uh, I told them that my first bad acid trip was to that record and they just cheered they were like yes <laughs> how many bad acid trips have you had enough like at least really at least five yeah oh, wow. oh okay i zero i'm still waiting uh, well, okay. what about the philosophy that there are no bad acid trips i mean being scared is one thing but they're all beneficial to some degree yeah, they were they were beneficial but it kind of drove me i just don't think my psyche was strong enough or or prepared for what i was going through at the time you know so um but yeah i was i'm grateful for any experience because anything you know where i come from they say that pain is the touchstone to all spiritual growth so in a way we don't grow unless it comes through something that at at one point the perception is that it might be difficult even though that's not really the case. There's not necessarily good and bad, in my opinion. It's just like uncomfortable. And some people like to run from discomfort. I like to walk through it at this I, point. I like to cause it. Yeah, I know <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, reality hurts, you know. Yeah. All so right. So does love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so these are all formative experiences to the point where you're like, I'm actually going to try to make it pro to it you know quote unquote and like take it on take it on the road uh, play professional play shows in real venues when when did that start 1990 or 91 i met some kids i tried to do college for about 10 seconds and i met some kids that were into you know they weren't exactly into what i was into they liked to like my bloody valentine and like uh sonic youth and all this kind of stuff which is cool but the we did this thing and we got in a, a Conoline van. We started playing shows that we booked ourselves. And then it got to a certain point where I was deviating and in more into like a the pussy galore, Neubauten kind of world. And it just was not fitting with these people. They just were like, no. And so the <laughs> other bands that were around at that time 
like Blues Explosion or Royal Trucks or whatever that were doing sort of like, again, I come from this kind of soul blues kind of thing. And they were in, involving that with sort of noise and punk and post-punk. And so I kind of started a band like that, which was called Delta 72. And I moved to Washington, D.C. because at the time there was a healthy scene there with like Discord records, like there were there was jazz there there was like all sorts of stuff there all of which is gone now because it's i think it's the wealthiest city per capita in this country right now so that goes to show what yeah. happens to culture when that shit goes down one like, small yeah. section of it is the wealthiest and the rest is still impoverished yeah but but it still brings those numbers up to the i think the yeah. wealthiest it's really yeah. anyhow this, well, this is digressing also- also, there was um, a couple of really great art movie theaters, the Biograph, and then there was also this place called the Key Theater, which I got a job at because they showed um, new and old art house movies, and the projectionist would let us come in after hours and bring the whole scene in, and we watch movies, you know. And it was like kind of a happening. I bought a moped. I was like a bo- mod on a budget, you know, and I was like riding around, starting a band, and then this band got put on the label discord and then split with touch and go i'm not touch and go kill rock stars from olympia and we started to tour and you know with those labels at the time you could kind of get shows and then eventually Corey rusk who owns touch and go records came around and was like i like what you what you're doing we shook hands 50 50 no contract and we started to record for touch and go and that was really sort of what i look at as sort of the beginning of um making this sort of i was always in it for life but like it made it that it was possible i could see like maybe i could do this and not have to get a nine to five you know and uh we which people don't realize how hard that really is when you're outsider musicians i mean we do it somehow, but I, I don't think it ever stops being hard. <laughs> it doesn't stop it's being a near hard. impossible. It's almost a masochistic life goal, but here we are and we're still doing it because we that's what we have to do. I mean, it's like there's nothing else that can exercise no. that inner that inner thing. And the one of the really greatest conversations I had besides with you was with Alan Vega, who I ended up collaborating with, but he he was like, you know, something when we were playing and the dolls were big and everyone's playing at Mercer Art Center, like everyone fucking hated us. The punk, the glam people like we would play open for the dolls in one room and people would literally be running through with holding their ears. And he was like, we likened ourselves to the trash heaps of New York and we call our music New York blues. And I kind of was like, yes, that's you know? it. Yep. And like, I, and so I've always gravitated to like the Velvets or Suicide or Neubauten, just like, or Stooges, whatever, I can Tina. They're just like, even though I can Tina had some commercialish hits with like, say, Proud Mary or something, there was a lot of like dark depth in there. And it's like, and it really speaks the same language to me that suicide speaks. You know, it's about the, the fact that they opened for Alice Cooper once. I saw a poster of that in Italy. I'm like, what? I can Tina Turner opening what? for Alice Cooper. What a great bill. They they were they were hustlers. And and going back to your point, Greg, about pain. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, I can Tina was is much uh, better than Tina Turner solo, and there was a lot of pain there. Oh God, I mean, yeah. So yeah. I mean, I mean, not- you can hear it in her voice. I mean, it's it's. It's almost like uh, there's certain soul singers. Uh, she's one of them. Mary Clayton, who did the vocals. Oh, Give me I mean, one, one of my favorite songs is Give Me Shelter. Come on. And she has a version that I, I'm sure I played when we've been hanging out. That is like her version of Give Me Shelter when she put out her solo record. And it's like there's like, heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it or it's like, again, to one day it makes the yeah. ha- every hair on your body. Stand well, up. people don't realize, look, like a lot of songs, people don't realize what the lyrics are. It's rape, murder. It's just a shot away. Yeah. I mean, people don't realize, I, which is one of the reasons I love doing cover albums, cover songs is the lyrics matter. And and especially give me shelter is a very political song and it's, it's bruising actually. Well, and also you could, you could make it what make out of it what you want. Like it could be a shot in the head or a shot in the arm, right. you know, like to turn it all shot off. in the dark. Exactly. Yeah. So it was like, 
The Stones and the Stooges, I, I appreciate because in a way I never really related to and nothing against it, but the, the sort of like San Francisco hippie kind of thing, it really never spoke to me. I mean, maybe like um, Captain Beefheart or something like that, but like that wasn't part of that really. But like I, I remember seeing a copy of the original Stooges record and it said the band that caused the death of the 60s or something like that, you know, and like. And to me, like Stooges, MC5, Velvet Underground, they sort of, they like brought it to the street. You know, it's like Dylan started to do that, I think. But like the the Velvets and all these other people were like, this is what's really going on. You know, you're not going to read about this in Time Magazine. You know? And what was really the streets was suicide. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And to me... There's the thing I love about suicide is that they can create something that's extremely like aesthetically beautiful, like Cherie or Dream Baby Dream. And at the same time, do Frankie Teardrop, which is like it like puts the fear of God in you, you know, like you're just like, oh, my God, this is what a murder sounds like on a two inch tape. You know, I will be back with my tribute to the group Suicide and Alan and Vega in France at the end of April and also in Bucharest. I can't wait. I'm so honored to be able to be doing the music of the people that influenced me so greatly just by their musical schizophrenia when I first met them in New York, I must say. So, Greg, Delta 72 had some success because you were signed, touch and go, et cetera. You were touring. So when did you sign? How, how long did that last? And then was L.A. your next move or did you spend some time scouring around New York, scrounging around New York for a while? Yeah, okay. So somewhere along the way, you know, I'd never really seen um heavy drugs, like the real stuff, you know. And uh at some point um I got turned on to kind of different forms of that stuff and it it sort of put an end to the Delta 72 and it kind of like I became sort of like your typical garden variety alcoholic junkie for maybe 5 years. And uh, it sort of just, I started to dismantle my life as that stuff tends to do. And and like, there's really only two ways you sort of, you, you get out of it by like either getting some sort of like help or you c continue on to the bitter end, you know? And like uh, this look that I got going on, believe it or not, does not go over that great in, in the correctional facility. <laughs> <laughs> It, it doesn't. So I was in a, I, I had moved from Philly to Miami to try and get, or the Miami area to try and get sober because I had an aunt there and there was a sort of like a detox community, but, you know. Getting, getting sober in Miami is not oh, so hard to do. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And then, so it, it ended, it took a little bit, bit of time and I ended up in a jail at Miami-Dade County and they looked like they were going to they weren't thrilled about my presence <laughs> but I went before the medical board which they do sometimes and I faked a full grand mal seizure because the best I could do was end up in the medical ward where people weren't going to try and fight me and I or had fuck you they, or fuck you yeah and what I what I what I hit there was like what is sometimes known as a spiritual bottom you know and uh and then I started to make the rounds instead of at like, you know, uh, abandoned houses. I started to show up at like meetings, which is just not for me. It's not for everyone. But like, and I started to sort of change everything. And well, and by, by the way, Greg, for those that it helps, it really helps. Yeah, it really does. I mean, everyone I know that's been in any kind of program, it has really helped them. Yeah, I mean, it's the only thing that worked for me because anytime I would be before a doctor or a psychiatrist, I would just lie to them to get more of what I thought I needed. And uh, so I, I was spending some time down there and then Judah Bauer, who is a member of the John Spencer Blues Explosion, hit me up and was like, do you know Cat Power? And I was like, yeah, I met her once. And she he was like, well, she's putting a band together and I recommended you to play keys. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, okay. And so she lived in Miami. So we met up and we hit it, we hit it off. And so I just joined that band, which also had Jim White from the Dirty Three. You know, the Dirty Three is like- I, Oh, they were great, the Dirty Three from Australia, right? Yeah, yeah. 
and uh you know warren ellis is in that band you know i mean the, so we just we just did some touring and it it kind of brought me up to another level of touring because she at the time was very successful so we played like the olympia in paris and like the roundhouse and all these places and, and shit that was a weird success because she i mean first of all her music is it's not going for any kind of mainstream it's right heavy depressive she had a lot of problems uh, obviously but it somehow hit a vein at that time with a lot of people which is interesting yeah, yeah it was like the soundtrack to like a lot of people's uh life-changing darkness you know and and to me the band that she put together with us was more like art damage blues you know what i mean because the people that were in it were just like you know coming at it from all the stuff we've talked about this whole time, soul, no wave, post-punk, you know? And so I did that for a, a while, years. And that, and I met some other people, like, you know, some of the bad seeds, we opened for them, The Cure, all this kind of stuff. And uh, in that time period, I started to evolve as a piano keyboard player. And like, you know, I used to, I knew how to play, but I started to like know how not to play too. Do you know what I mean? Like the notes in between became just as important as the notes that I Okay, play. now Greg, you are hitting upon something I say all the time. It's like in spoken word, the space between breaths. It's also the Roland S. Howard theory of playing. Like yep. the economy of sound can be very important. Exactly. And like I, coming from like punk and things like Black Flag, I didn't really know much about space. And even when I would hear like Coltrane or or Nick Coleman. Well, I, Thelonious Monk is the master of the rest. Of course, yeah. yeah. But I didn't really put it together. And then that's that's something I really learned is how to play with other people and how to how to be OK with just doing what's necessary, but not what's unnecessary. And uh, we did that for a long time the band evolved in different ways. And then eventually I became the musical director for the band and did that. I mean, so I did it from 2006. I started with the band musically directed the band from 2012 to like 2017. And then a great uh, run with something that's evolving that you can have input in. Yes. Yes. I mean, I would have liked to have a little more input, but I think she has a way that she does things that works for her. And it's like, she's usually she's almost never wrong so it's like it works but uh then i got invited to play with peter buck you guys might know from rem and uh you know i've never really listened to rem but he was a guy that also really loved like his musical tastes he loves like you know nikki sudden he did a record with nikki sudden he he loved i didn't know that that's amazing yeah 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 he's he loves like um What's the band from uh, Athens? That's the Pylon. He he was friends with them, and like so, he's really into like tons of forty five soul, all the stuff we've been talking about. And I was like, I I'll do a band with Peter Buck because he's so fucking cool. And we did that, and then I'm up in Portland just hanging around. This is probably 2018, and I get a a message from Beth Ditto, who's the singer of that band, The Gossip. Beth was like, she had wanted me to be her musical director years before, but it didn't work out. And she was like, hey, got some shows coming up. You interested in playing? And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. I love you. You know, it'd be, it'd be fun. Then I get this email and it was like all these tour dates. And I was like, this is, what is this? And and the manager was like, oh, do you want to, the gossip are reforming too. Would you like to do that? And I was like, yeah, okay. So we did a bunch of shows uh, with Beth's band. We did like a Cartier event in like Shoreditch. It was crazy. And then we flew immediately to Mexico to open for Florence and the Machine, which were crazy big shows. And then then the gossip tour started. And I mean, then Beth Ditto, I mean, like Cat Powers, it's another strange success story. I mean, in a very different way, though. Yeah. Because yeah. for some reason, Beth Ditto also hit a weird nerve that yeah. people responded to. Yeah. yeah, they're really big in the... Um, so I had no clue what their fan base was. And in Europe, they had like... In France especially, they had like songs in the top 10 on the charts. And she really... Um, 
they have a huge LGBTQ following and uh, and just like punks and weirdos. Because to me, they sort of sound like if Gang of Four um, and Giorgio Moroder started a band, you know, <laughs> with like, and her voice is just epic. So I did that. And then right around 2019, we had finished the tour. I was in Paris where I saw you, where you were performing. Um, and uh, came home and then COVID started unraveling, you know, and uh, usually I get hit up around this time. Well, so right now we're in like, we're in like mid-March. So end of February, mid-March, I get hit up to to tour with people, just whoever. And I gotten a text from this guy called Raphael, who has a band called Prayers, and his wife is Kat Von D., the tattoo artist, who I, again, I had heard of, but I, you know, she had reality TV shows and Well, makeup. she's an amazing portrait artist. Yeah. She really is. I mean, she's an amazing tattoo artist. I just didn't know much about her. I, I knew who she was. I just didn't know anything about her. And uh, we had crossed paths once or twice, but she was like, I'm looking for someone who plays every instrument and that I that that has good style and looks cool. And he was like, oh, you're my friend Greg. You should check him out. And she looked at my Instagram or something was like, oh, he's cool. Can you put it, introduce us? And I went over to her place, this like giant Gothic mansion in, in LA and uh, with like just legitimate uh legitimate like pieces of art everywhere and uh you know just like crazy artwork and, and uh we talked about music and she told me what she was into and I was like oh yeah we could play together that sounds great and then I became her musical director but then COVID hit there was no touring to be had as you remember and she was like you could just move into my guest house and uh we could work on a record and she had done a record with Alan Mulder who uh was a producer who worked with Depeche Mode and, you know, people like that. And uh, she wanted to do a all synthesizer record. And I was like, well, you know, that's in my wheelhouse. And I started doing this thing. And, uh, and then we did a little tiny tour because that's all we could do during the lockdowns. It's like four shows. And then she was like, hey, I, you know, I didn't have time to really promote this record. Do you want to do another one? And I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And so we just have been working on this record. And it's just kind of strange for me because like, I do like all the, I'll write a bunch of stuff. And then she'll, her producer is this guy who produced like the big Lady Gaga record, which oh, is, you know, yeah, I don't know anything about that stuff. You know, I don't know anything about that stuff. So <laughs> It's interesting, like for me, it's always cool to play and work with new people because at least you like learn something else or you or at the very least you learn something about yourself. And uh, we've been doing that and the record's being mixed now. And then, but in the interim of all this stuff, I've done stuff like Back Up You with the sitar and the guitar, the keys. Played Sylvia with Black record, yeah. yeah I played with... Um, David J of Bauhaus. I I did a whole thing with the Stooges band with James Williamson. Um, wait, 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 wait. How about tell us a little about that? What do you mean? Okay. You do? What was that about? So you know the Stooges had gotten back together, and Ron Ashton was the guitar player. Then he passed away, and so Iggy, I guess, was like, "Oh, we should get James back because he did Iggy and the Stooges, which is raw power." Um, which some say is the best Stooges record. I like them all, but um, I like. Yeah, the Stooges records, I like them all. Yeah, and so he, I got this email, and it was the craziest email. Like, you know, there's certain people that if you, like, get a message from, you're like, whoa. And I got this email from James Williamson. It was like, hey, um, putting putting a, a recording session together, I hear you're a great keyboard player. Like, any interest? And I was like, yes. Basically, he wanted to revisit... The records that we know is Metallic KO, which were oh, like excuse me. And also let's also talk about Kill City, one of my favorite Joha Johanna, that's one of my favorite Iggy Pop songs post the Stooges with that, James Williamson. Such, oh. a, such a great record and song. So he wanted to do record all that stuff, you know, bring it out of the, you know, the shadows. Right. But he, you know, him and Iggy were taking some space. So he decided that he would have the Stooges band, but with like different vocalists doing the song. So it would be like, you know, I'm trying to think who, who, 
you know, uh, Mark Lanigan did some stuff. Uh, Allison Mosshart from The Kills. Uh, I did two great vocalists. Uh, Mark Lanigan, I mean, great oh, vocalist. Really and great stuff. People like Bobby Gillespie from Primal Screen. You know, it's just like whoever. And so I was the keyboard player on all this stuff. And like, uh, at the same time, I was also dipping my feet in producing. I did a record for a, a band that's doing really well here and really cool called L.A. Witch. I did I produced one of their EPs, played with the Death Valley Girls, produced a record for Kate Clover, like all these really great. So if you really look back at my career or whatever you want to call it, it's like there's always a strong female presence. And I grew up with just a mom and a sister. No, you know, I had a stepdad at some point, but like it absolutely feels weird to me to be in a band that's just all guys. I don't know why, but it's just like I feel comfortable and just the way that. They well, use- let me just add my two cents to this, Greg. You're a terrible or should I say wonderful romantic, first of all. Mm-hmm. I know this from our private conversations. You adore women. And women love you. That's just that the way it is. Uh, that's just the way it is. When was, uh, <laughs> when, was, when was the last time you were in an all male band? Um, I was in a band called Pink Mountain Tops for a while. That was like um, the guy from Steve McBean from the band Black Mountain, who were like a huge psych band from Canada, and uh, that was great. But there was also some women in that uh, a woman I dated called Louise, who's an Ital- I mean Italian, amazing musician from Paris, and we like did a, like a three piece. It, it was cool. But uh, now, Greg, did you did you mention to me in passing when we were in LA that you're now again finally starting your own band? Yeah, well, I tried that at one point. We, there was a band that was starting to pick up some steam here. That was a little bit, uh, you know, without comparing it to stuff, it had some stuff of like all the things we're talking about, a little bit of the fall, a little bit of like birthday party. It was called Grotesque. And uh, I was a singer and I played in, in slide guitar. You know, it had a little gallon drunk in it maybe, but um, one of the, you know, as part of being sober, sometimes, you know, I've relapsed. There's been, pe- but there was a person in the band that relapsed, and it made it impossible to move forward. So we just kind of put that on hold. And now was the first time I've had some time, and like doing doing the stuff with you, where I'm playing actually the guitar, which I don't get a, ch- a lot to chance to. Which do. you're a great guitar player, yeah. Thank you. I don't get a chance to do it a lot professionally because people have always want keys. I don't know why. Maybe because there's a lack of keyboard players, but. Uh, I wanted to do something that like not that dissimilar from some of the stuff we've been doing together, you and me. And uh, because it sort of accesses that sort of like dark Western jazz noir. Right. Lee Hazelwood, Roland S. Howard Vane. Yes, exactly. Um, with a hint of Ike and Tina Turner. You know, I, want <laughs> be, I want you to be able Maybe to you need some backup singers there, honey. Right, exactly. But um, thunder so, thighs. You need some thunder thighs behind you instead of just in front of you, like when Sylvia Black and I are right. standing in so, front of you. <laughs> well, the guy that we um, so I brought my friend in to play to play with us the other day called Andres, and he's like a great musician from Colombia. And uh, I always I just wanted to jam with him, and it just worked out that he could fill in when we did the thing and. We just were looking at each other like, oh, this sounds pretty cool. We should just keep going with this, you know? I think you should. Uh, so, Greg, I mean, so you're being hired and working with a big variety of artists playing keyboards. Now, keyboards can be as wide as a spectrum as just music itself. So tell me about that. I mean, I mean, yeah. can, I mean can you play piano, for instance? I, I mean, are you are you... Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, and so. by, by the way, before you answer, Greg, I just want to say, you know, James Johnston, you mentioned Gallon Drunk. Also, post Gallon Drunk was Big Sexy Noise. He, also one of my favorite guitar players, was hired a lot to play the keys as well. Yeah. And he's somebody I really look up to as a, uh, like when I, when I was young, and I'll just tell this story really quick. I went to see PJ Harvey in like 92, and Gallon Drunk was the opener. 
and they, oh my God, they smoked the building. It was so great. I had never seen anything like that. And uh, because again, it also had a bit of soul, a bit of blues, hard yeah. rock, very sexy, um, great guys as well. Yeah. So the keyboard, what there, are, what I've seen around are there are keyboard players that play the synth and they play, they play like some chords and they can use it. They can like use the computer and make sounds and that's cool. Um, I have like going back to the sitar. Why do I like the sitar rather than the, the sitar guitar? It's like all these synths, like there's electronic instruments but i've always been fascinated like blade runner like how to give inanimate objects soul give them a like because really i feel like everybody wants to meet their maker no they want soul on some level and so the combination of like the philosophy i guess or the script behind blade runner and the synths and the keys like i grew up listening to like aretha gospel for example and that's a whole nother animal. So I would sit at home listening to Aretha Gospel, just mimicking the best I could what I heard, right? Piano and organ, basically. I mean, piano and Hammond organ, Wurlitzer, you name it. And so when I got in cat power, I got a chance to kind of access that and do it for a living. And then so when I get hired for a while, you know, Linda Perry, who produced like all these big singers and wrote for like. Christina Aguilera and Pink, she likes my playing too. So she would like, I get hired to play with some of her artists and she'd give people notes and then she'd be like, I'm like, what, what do I need anything? She's like, no, you're great. You're fine. So I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, doing good, doing good. I just want to cut in for a minute. You were saying giving inanimate objects soul. And one of my favorite books is called The Secret Life of Inanimate Objects. That doesn't really talk about guitars, guitars or synths or keyboards. Well, but you know, I was I saying, what I, you're saying I always wanted to produce a TV show based on when animals attack, but when inanimate objects attack, like like like, like basically when someone wrapped up in a chair and being stuck or <laughs> just that, that kind of thing. But I'll, I'll send you a, a link. There's a there's a Carl Heinz Stockhausen lecture at Oxford in 72 where someone's talking about, you know, classical electronic music and, and the person's like, will this survive because they're implying maybe there's no soul in this. And he basically, in a long winded way, calls the person a primate. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll send you that link. But. Well, well I just you know, one step further, like an article I sent you yesterday, Tim, about the sounds that plants make and now that they've had an acute enough microphone to listen to them as they're being either starved, droughted or cut. And uh, that's just the, the, well, the nth degree of that. On special nights, I, they also make special movements. <laughs> well, so. for you, <laughs> I, you commune with them, especially uh, when you're tripping. Yeah, hello, yes. <laughs> Anyhow, there's a great record called, I think it's called Synesthesia. It's like the music for plants or something. But I'd uh, love to hear singing. I'm, yeah, I mean, but, is it, <laughs> was that uh, album put out by Robert Plant? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, the cool thing is like that I, I watch all these documentaries and when 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 the synthesizer before it became commercially available for people to buy in like a shop, they were like these monolith modular things that like Wendy Carlos would do Clockwork Orange with and all this stuff. So uh, these British kids, um, kids like, Cabaret, yeah. like Cabaret Voltaire, Throbbing Gristle, people like that, they were like, OK, so punk is three chords we could get a synth and the, and craft work was playing and things like that. So they were just like, Whoa, this is like something else. So clockwork orange craft work. And they're like, now we don't even need three chords. We can just make these sort of like, um, like dystopian soundscapes on these like synthesizers that are now becoming commercially available. So that's when you start to hear from bands like, uh, throbbing gristle, cabaret, Voltaire, fad gadget, you know, all of a sudden, this stuff is making its way. And then of course it makes its way into pop culture with like stuff like human league, soft cell who soft cell to me are just like suicide who also like Northern soul. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and so again, goes back to like all of a sudden bands like Toto are having synthesizers replace their Hammond organs because they want to stay on times, you know? 
Well, yeah. Well, I mean, the the Bacaro family is kind of. I mean, I hate Toto, but they're but they're kind of actually incredible uh, musicians. Incredible musicians. Yeah, yeah. Oh exactly. my god. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, really, the the keyboard to me, um, I'm just as I love the ability to create these dystopian, you know, s soundscapes with the synths, but I also am just as happy playing like some gospel on the Hammond organ. Like I just love both. And so uh, go going out with cat power, how many, how many keyboards are you looking at every night? Okay. Well, it started with, um, we had a Wurlitzer and we rented a, uh, it's like, actually first it was like an apartment style minute piano with a Hammond XK3 on top, which is like their, their version of like a travelable thing. And what's hooked up to, a uh, it's hooked up to a, um, Leslie speaker. Eventually the drummer was like, it's too loud. It's too much shit. So we got <laughs> ourselves like this at the time there was that keyboard that came out called the Nord, which emulated all that stuff pretty good, you know? And so we just traveled with one of those instead of three different keyboards. Oh, I mean, yeah. Doing the old school way is <laughs> very difficult on many levels. Yeah. It was like the traveling in the Allman brothers band or something. It's like, I got like, a piano, an electric piano, an organ, and eventually, it just became overkill. So, have uh, you have you ever tried? You know, you know those giant fake grand pianos like the like Yamaha make, and they even have motors to create the vibration. So, you know, some ma major arena person wants to look like well, there's a grand piano there, but it's a, a synthesizer in a case of one, and they and they they're supposed to be like insane. But anyhow, well, um, you know, REM and all these things, when we went to practice, we rehearsed at their space and they have these giant cases that look like a piano, but inside is a space where you slide in a synthesizer or a keyboard. So it looks like you're really playing in the deal, but really inside yeah. is a keyboard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really like the baby toy grand pianos for my sound. Yeah. But I only do that in my house when nobody's listening. So Greg, <laughs> You've got a few things coming up, but this concept of you with your own band, which I think is a very good idea, involving all the musical styles you're, you know, that so have influenced you. And I just think it's it's mandatory that that happens soon. I'm I mean, counting. I'm counting on you. But you know how it is. Is like Tim no, I don't know how it is. <laughs> Tim, know knows, how Tim knows <laughs> because like sometimes when you're you got to pay the, you got to keep the lights on, right? So you got to take these other gigs that are, that, you know, you get a choice to get pick what gigs you do, but you got to do them in order to keep your life going. You know, sometimes, yeah. sometimes I, it'll, I, I understand. <laughs> well, yeah, they, but, they, but, but they also called, especially for the, you know, A list session players, they call them, call it golden handcuffs because at some point you got to take those off if you want to do your own thing too. So, I mean, I don't know if, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have the gold man. As, 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 as an expert in your own thing, not being the thing that pays the goddamn rent, unless you're a juggler like I am, I understand you got to be a professional juggler. And with that, I think we're going to wrap this up because this is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Greg Foreman. Thank you so much for having me.